Happy Sunday morning, boys and girls. It's your old pal, Andy France, the Grand Poobah of Judson Sunday School. Welcome back to another episode of Virtual Judson Sunday School. So last week we were talking about superheroes, everyone from Captain America to Captain Marvel to the Black Panther, the Black Widow, Batman, Wonder Woman, but apparently I left a couple out. For example, do you know who this guy is? Who is this? This is Hiro Hamada from the movie Big Hero 6. Now, I know that several of you are big fans of Hiro Hamada and Big Hero 6, but for those of you who may not be familiar with him, Hiro, spelled H-I-R-O, is a robotics genius living in the town of San Francisco. Following the suspicious death of Hiro's older brother, Tadashi, Hiro teams up with a robot Tadashi created named Baymax, and along with uh, four of Tadashi's friends, they seek to solve the mystery of Tadashi's death by forming a band of superheroes known as Big Hero Six. Now, Hero's superpower is his genius. And like many of the superheroes we talked about last week, Hero, is, he, he has a kind heart, but he struggles to control his emotions. Now, I'm not going to give any of the movie away other than to say that by the time it's over, thanks to the help of the robot Baymax, Hero comes to value the lives of all human beings and refuses to carry out any acts of justice which involve violence. Now, there's someone else we left out last week. How about this young woman? Does she look familiar to anybody? What's her name? This is Mulan. Now, whether it's the 1998 animated version or last year's live action adaptation, both movies are based on a legendary Chinese warrior by the name of Hua Mulan, who, in order to save her elderly father, she enlists or disguises herself as a man and takes her father's place in the Imperial Chinese Army in their war against the invading Huns. Now, technically, Mulan is more hero than superhero. In the animated version of the movie, she does have a, um, a magical uh, dragon, Mushu. And if you saw last year's live-action adaptation, uh, she has a, a flying, a sort of a magical bird, a phoenix. But, and both Mushu and the phoenix will help Mulan in her quest to save the emperor. But Mulan herself doesn't have any superpowers. Although just between you and me, I would not want to get in a fight with Mulan. Nevertheless, um, Mulan does display all of those um, characteristics that we love in those superheroes we talked about last week. Compassion and empathy and courage. Now, besides their youth and their heroic qualities, both Mulan and uh, Hero have something else in common. Do you know what it might be? Well, both Mulan and Hero are of Asian are of um, Asian descent. Mulan is Chinese, and Hiro Hamada is Japanese American. And I thought it would be fun to talk about these two characters because, well, today is the first Sunday of May, and here in the United States, the month of May is what is known as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Now. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, or our word of the day is not a word, it's an acronym, AAPI, stands for uh, people whose ancestors come from Asian countries such as China and Japan, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, the Philippines, 
North or South Korea and other Asian countries, as well as South Asian countries, such as India and Bangladesh and um, what else? Uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, and other countries like that. Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month recognizes their contributions and their influences in the history, culture, and achievements of the United States. Now, even though Mulan and Hero are both fictional characters, we certainly could use their help these days more than ever. That's because ever since the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic in December of 2019 in Wuhan, China, Asian Americans have become targets of hate crimes. Now, what is a hate crime? A hate crime is a crime committed against someone based solely on their race or their sex or their sexual orientation or their religion or some other um, uh, social group denominator. From March 2020 to February of this year, there is an organization known as Stop AAPI Hate that tracked 3,000 795 incidents of AAPI hate crimes across the United States. Here in New York City, the New York City Police Department reported a 1,900% increase in anti-Asian crimes in 2020. And in, real, in reality, that number is probably much higher because most hate crimes go unreported. Now, these hate crimes range from verbal harassment, yelling at someone, uh, calling them names, insulting them, to uh, being coughed at or spat upon, and even physical assaults. Recently, across the United States, members of the AAPI community have been violently harmed by being pushed and beaten and robbed and slashed with knives and even murdered. For Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, this past year has been an extremely scary, if not traumatic year, not only because of the coronavirus pandemic, but also because of this new anti-Asian or Asian hate virus that is sweeping our country. Let's watch this video of a young mother trying to explain to her children this new virus of Asian hate. Ready for another sight word test? Yep. yep. There's a message in this one, so I want you to think about it. Okay. Stop. Stop. Asian. Asian. Hate. Hate. Is. E. A. I. Business. Be virus. Virus. Fighting. Well, why would we call hate a virus? Because viruses infect, infect people. They infect people. Do you think hate can do the same thing? Mm -hmm. Like feel, make, fe make people feel bad. Racism is, pe is that somebody, is that if somebody looks different, they say that they're like not as good as the other mm -hmm. because they look different based on the color of their skin or like if they're Asian. And we talked about recent acts of violence against Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. And how did that make you feel? Sad because they killed people. Mm -hmm. They yeah. killed Asian people. Yeah. And that could be somebody that we know, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How do you think we should respond to things like that? Like not liking it. We can speak out against it. Mm -hmm. We can talk about it. Mm -hmm. We can build awareness, mm -hmm. right? Because not everybody might know what's going on, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So much of the current vitriol or anger directed at Asian Americans can be traced to our last president, Donald Trump, who following the outbreak of the coronavirus spent much of his time and energy going around the country calling it the China virus or the Kung flu. By April of last year, 
One survey found that three out of every 10 Americans blame China or Chinese people for the virus. But discrimination against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders is nothing new in our country. From the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which was the first law in the United States which barred immigrants based solely on their race, in that case, Chinese, to the Executive Order 9066, signed by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1942, which rounded up thousands of Japanese Americans, many of whom were United States citizens, some even second and third generation Americans, and locked them away in internment camps or prison camps for the duration of World War II. Now, Americans have never been shy when it comes to expressing their displeasure with people the majority considered to be different. Here at Virtual Judson Sunday School, we have spent many a Sunday talking about racism and prejudice and white privilege and Black Lives Matter and the importance of becoming anti-racists and developing respect for others no matter their race or their sex or their sexual orientation or their religion or anything else that might separate them from the majority. This is certainly true for our brothers and sisters who are of Asian and Pacific Island descent. The need for kindness and the golden rule, treating others the way you want to be treated, has never been more important. So, this month of May, let us dedicate ourselves to educating ourselves about the contributions that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have made to this country. And even though the heroes we talked about earlier, Hiro Hamada and Mulan, might be fictional, let us draw on those very real characteristics we so admire in them, their kindness, their empathy, their courage, as we stand as allies with the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. So, how many of you like to draw? I know many of you do because I have been lucky enough to be on the receiving end of many of your pictures, including just this past week, this picture from our good friend Owen. I think the word got out that I haven't been feeling well lately, and Owen was kind enough to send me this Feel Better Andy, and it's got you know, what I first thought was a baseball player, but then I took a closer look, and this is a cricket player. That's a cricket bat and ball and the leggings and things like that. So, oh, and this is terrific, and thank you so much. It did make me feel better. Today's story is about um, a young woman who loved to draw when she was your age. In fact, Gio Fujikawa would grow up to become a very famous illustrator and children's book author. She was uh, the illustrator of some 50 books and wrote 45 of them. Her work has been translated into 17 different languages and published in 22 countries. Many of her books are considered classics, including this one, Babies, and its companion book, Baby Animals, which together have sold more than two million copies. Now, I want to do something. I want to show you a couple of pictures in this book. Let's start out right here. I want you to look at this picture and tell me what you see. Now, I know I can't hear what you're saying, but can you tell me something about this picture? What do you notice? And then let me show you one more picture and see if you see the same thing. Do you notice that these are babies of different races? Well, in 1963, when this book was published, the idea of babies of different races appearing in a picture book simply wasn't done. Ms. Fujikawa is recognized as being the earliest mainstream author 
um, to have different races in her work long before it became commonplace to do so. As, an, as a Japanese-American, uh, Ms. Fujikawa also knew the pain of discrimination. Her family was one of many Japanese-American families that were rounded up and sent to internment camps during, during World War II. In fact, her family was actually first sent to the Santa Anita racetrack, which was a horse racetrack in California, um, and her family was actually forced to live in the horse stalls until they were later transferred to an internment camp, a prison camp in Arkansas. Mrs. Uh, Gio, not Mrs., Ms. Gio Fujikawa, her life has made uh, for an inspiring story for artists, perhaps like you, and it's told so well in our story today, which is, it began with a page how Gio Fujikawa drew the way by Keo McClear, and it's illustrated by Julie Morstad. Let's read it. It began with a page, bright and beckoning. It began with a mother writing a poem, and a father working a field, and a little girl named Gio drawing a picture. It was 1913, and Gio was five years old. That morning, her mama said, Ohio, sleepyhead. Ohio is Japanese for good morning. Ohio, sleepyhead, it's going to be a busy day. And it was. Right until nightfall. Mama's friends had come, and they were full of talk. We sailed to America with our best kimono to see what we could be. Such disappointment. We need the vote. We need rights. Gio held her rice bowl and listened with curious ears. Did Gio know what she wanted to be? Not yet. There's Gio down under the table. What she did know was that she liked to draw. She loved the feel of the pencil in her hand, the dance and the glide of a line, how a new color could change everything, a bright splash of yellow, a sleepy stroke of blue. Every day, she started with an empty white page and filled it with pictures. I love the water coming out of the elephant's trunk there, don't you? At home, surrounded by drawing tools and books, anything was possible. But at school, Gio didn't feel that way. At school, no one said, that girl sure can draw. No one noticed her colored pencils or box of paints. No one even noticed when she moved away. Gio's new home was a fishing village near San Pedro, California, a haven for Japanese Americans, a new life. Roaming with her friends, Gio felt weightless and free. A ferry ride away at her high school, Gio sometimes still felt invisible among her mostly white classmates. But her drawings caught the attention of two teachers. Who was this girl whose eyes missed nothing, who could sketch rivers and boats and birds like a dream? Miss Cole and Miss Blum saw the energy in each line of her drawings. Gio was too poor to go to art school, but Miss Cole found money to pay her way. Gio was nervous to leave her home for the buzz and bustle of downtown Los Angeles. Not many girls, and even fewer Asian American girls, went to college in 1926. But Gio was determined. She sketched statues, flowers, and faces. Her sketchbook filled up one after another.
Hungry to know more, Gio set off for Japan, the land of her ancestors, to study traditional Japanese brush painting. But the teachers were full of rules. Instead, she traveled around the country doing her own learning, woodblocks, carving tools, inks made of soot. She lost herself in the prints of Hiroshige, Utamaro, and Hokusai. and floated in a beautiful sea of kimono. Travel fed her dreams, but back in America, it was time to earn money. For the next few years, Gio worked long days painting murals and drawings for magazines. In 1941, she was offered a temporary job designing books at Walt Disney Studio in New York, a city filled with art and artists. It was hard for Gio to leave her family, especially her mother. Little did she know, things were about to get harder still. In early 1942, terrible things were happening. Bombs and gunfire rocked the world. America was at war with Japan. Gio was shocked to discover that anyone who looked Japanese or had a Japanese name was now suspected of being the enemy. Japanese Americans living on the West Coast were ordered to leave their homes, their schools, their pets, their everything. Gio, along with others living on the East Coast, was told to stay where she was. On the West Coast, families preparing to leave tried to sell their larger belongings, like cars and furniture, to junk dealers, but they were offered only pennies. I won't sell, said Gio's mother, you. Instead, she set everything ablaze. Gio's family was sent to a prison camp far, far away from their home. Gio's heart was broken. For the next three years, the world shrank, became tiny and terrible. Now, when she gazed at a white page, no pictures would come. Gio mailed her family letters and sent gifts for her new nephew born in the camp but her heart would not mend. These are her parents, and this is her brother Fred and his wife and new baby. Eventually, Gio began to draw again. She drew to keep her worries still and to save money her family would need. When angry strangers saw her as the enemy, drawing comforted her. When the world felt gray, color lifted her. She wondered, could art comfort and lift others too? And there's Gio under this beautiful umbrella. Ah, see if I can turn the page. When the war ended, the Fujikawas were released. With no house or savings to call their own, they had to start again. For Gio, the next 15 years passed swiftly. There were stamps to create. And by the way, Gio designed six different stamps for the Postal Service. There were stamps to create, store windows to decorate, a children's book of poetry to illustrate. There were two poodles who needed loving. Now, when Gio walked around the city collecting ideas for her pictures, she began to notice little changes around her. And here we see Gio observing some protesters protesting segregation. And here are her poodles. Still, there was so much that hadn't changed. At the library and bookshop, it was the same old stories. 
mothers in aprons and fathers with pipes and a world of only white children. Gio knew a book could hold more and do more. A book, she told her poodles, can be anything that anyone imagines it to be. Gio knew what she wanted to do. Every day she started with an empty page and filled it with pictures and words. When her book was done, she gave it to a publisher. And what did they see? Ah, they saw pages that wouldn't turn. There we go. Babies. Chubby-cheeked, squat-legged, bouncy-bottomed babies. Naughty nice, oh-so-busy, toddle-crawling babies. But the publisher said no. No to mixing white babies and black babies. It was not done in the early 1960s America, a country with laws that separated people by skin color. But Gio would not budge. She closed her eyes and remembered all the times she had felt unseen and unwelcome. She looked the publisher in the eye and said, It shouldn't be that way. Not out there in the streets, not here on this page. We need to break the rules. Then she waited for them to rethink their decision. The babies waited too and waited. But babies cannot wait. Finally, the publisher said yes, and the book did well, very well. Babies loved it, so Gio kept going, welcoming kids in from the edges, from the corners, from the shadows. Gio let each child find a place. Kids and boys, girls and boys, freed from pink or blue, sharing jokes, joys, mishaps, bruises, all sprawling out across the bright page, ready for a bigger, better world. It began with a page. Well, kids, it's time for Little Trip to Heaven by Tom Waits. Today, what I'm going to do is sing the song all the way through. I won't sing too fast, but I'm not going to stop and say, turn the page or anything like that. Because what I'm hoping we will do is use today's version of the song as uh, what you will practice against, what you will make your video against. The idea is that you will sing along with this video, making your own video, and send it to me in a few weeks' time so that we can include it in the Kids' Day service, which I think is about six weeks away. Yikes! So... Let's sing Little Trip to Heaven together, and I will hold up the pictures, and hopefully I will have them in the right order, and I won't screw that up. So here we go. One, two, three. Little trip to heaven on the wings of your love. Banana moon is shining in the sky. I feel like I'm in heaven when you're with me. I know that I'm in heaven when you smile. Though we're stuck here on the ground, I got something that I found, and it's you. I don't have to take no trip to outer space. All I have to do is look at your face And before I know it, I'm in orbit around you Thanking my lucky stars that I found you When I see your constellation Honey, you're my inspiration And it's you You're my north star when I'm lost and feeling blue. The sun is breaking through the clouds, don't you know it's true? 
Honey, all the other stars seem dim around you. Thanking my lucky stars that I found you. When I see your smiling face, honey, I know nothing's going to take your place. And it's you, and it's you, and it's you, and it's you. And it's you, and it's you, and it's you, and it's you. Shubi do papara. How'd you do? Well, we've done it again, boys and girls. It looks like we've somehow managed to get through another episode of Virtual Judson Sunday School. As always, I want to thank Andre and Michelle for all of their help putting this episode together. And I want to thank you for being with me today as well. One quick announcement. Um, this month being Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, I noticed that the New York Historical Society Museum has several AAPI exhibits going up this month that you might want to check out as we educate ourselves on the contributions of the AAPI community. So until we meet again, I want to ask you to stay safe. Uh, what do I say every week? Uh, keep a place for Judson in your heart, and I'll see you again next time on Virtual Judson Sunday School.